<clears throat> we are in 1 Corinthians. This is our fifth class in this series. Um, I want to go back again um, with Acts 17, 11. This is kind of wants to be this, our, my mantra or our mantra, you know, to receive the word with readiness of mind and search the scriptures daily because it's up to us to make sure what is being taught is true and accurate. Um, so I want you to always keep that scripture in your mind as you're studying, prepare yourselves to be here for worship. Also, I want to review a little bit. Corinth, again, as I've mentioned, was like a combination of New York or New Orleans or Las Vegas and Hollywood all wrapped up into one. This was sin, a port city. It was also a sin city, and it was a growth city. Um, people could go there and get wealthy. He had, Paul had been in Athens. He'd been with all the philosophers, and now he's within Corinth, and I'd kind of mentioned he's with the dock workers now. He's with the common people. But... Again, Corinth, the, say the, a Corinthian and a fornicator was synonymous because, again, Aphrodite, the temple was there. There was like a thousand prostitutes working in that temple. Fornication was rampant. So to call somebody a Corinthian was to say they were a fornicator. It was synonymous. And sadly, that could possibly be said about most large city in America today. I was just talking to a gentleman recently told me they had hired a bunch of people at his work and one of his co-workers said, are they standing outside the prison and hiring people as they're coming out? Because all of them look like they just got released from prison. That was a sad commentary on this company. But that's what we're facing in America today. I want to go back a little bit with verse 25. Um, I know we covered that last week, but I left some things off my slide because I thought I could remember, and I didn't, so I want to retouch on this a little bit. These slides are for me more than they are for you, just so you know that. <laughs> but because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Again, foolishness and God just doesn't go together in my brain. Weakness and God does not necessarily go together in my brain. Here you've got God, the creator of everything. He's weak or foolish. But he's comparing that with wiser than men. The wisest man that ever lived isn't comparable to whatever we would consider foolishness of God. The strongest men who ever lived, it would be even comparable to the weakness of God. Um, Linda and I have been watching... Young Sheldon, I, I, the first four seasons or so were really good. It gets a little too much adult situation than the last one. But for, if you want 20 minutes of humor, it's good to just kind of relax. But, you know, here you got a, a genius prodigy who doesn't believe there's a God because he's too smart to believe there's a God. Again, wiser, the foolishness of God wiser than the strongest men. But, and I said that was the ultimate oxymoron last time. You know, God seems to go out of his way to do things differently than what we would expect or how he would expect. Almost to the, to the sense of being weird in a way. We mentioned some of that. Noah and his barge in Genesis. Moses and the brazen serpent. And this is part of what I didn't, re, didn't mention last time. With the brazen serpent. A thousand years later, they're worshiping this brazen serpent. The Jews are. They're lighting incense to it and worshiping it. And Hezekiah actually has to destroy it in 2 Kings 18.4. And then, you know, we wouldn't even understand what the symbolism is about the brazen serpent, except Jesus explained it to Nicodemus in John 3.14. He said, just as the brazen serpent was lifted up, the Son of Man must be lifted up. So that symbolism there. Um, but is that how we would cure snake bites? No. That's not how we would think about curing snake bite. Again, that's the, you know, God had a plan in all this is my point. Then you've got Samson, the jawbone of an ass, killing a thousand people. David and Goliath. You know, here you've got David couldn't even wear Saul's armor because he was so small and weak going up against the giant Goliath. Again, the foolishness of God. Elisha and the, Naaman and the leper dipping in the Jordan to cure his leprosy seven times. Joan and the big fish, the walls of Jericho, Jesus curing the blind man by making spittle out of his, I mean, using his spittle to make clay. And then sins forgiven when immersed in the waters of baptism. Again, the ultimate foolishness. But in thinking about that with today, because today is what the world 
views as Resurrection Sunday or Easter Sunday, isn't the ultimate foolishness that God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, who was the perfect lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place, the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha, where they crucified him. I'm just going to tell you, it's a good thing I'm not God because I would not be able to do this. Again, foolishness of God. I don't understand the wares, the wines, or all this, but you know, Linda used to do pottery. She, and she was telling me, you know, when you mess up a thing, you can just scrunch it back down and start over again. Or sometimes it just can't be done and you just throw it to the side and you start all over with a fresh lump of clay. You know, if I was God, I don't know how many times I'd already started over. I just kept wiping them out and starting over and wiping them out and starting over. I would not have sacrificed my son. I'm just saying that's just me as a human with children. But we can't understand this, that God, before time began, was willing to do this for us. And the wisdom of God, we mentioned in the crucifixion, of God outsmarted the wise men of the earth and therefore nullified their wisdom. He overpowered his enemies on the cross with grace and forgiveness. He took away their strength or their worldly wisdom. <clears throat> Verse 26 says, for you, for you see your calling, brethren. Again, he's calling them brethren. That not many wise, according to the flesh, not many mighty, mighty, not many noble are called. I want you to think about that. Not many wise. Again, the smart people. I want you, if you can see the simple truth of the gospel, thank God you're not too smart not to see it. You know, smartness can fade. When I was growing up, I could do math in my head like a, I mean, like a human calculator. I can't do that in my head anymore. I could remember things. I could sit through a lecture in class, take notes, take the test, make an A. Very simple. Never had to study. Can't do that anymore. Wisdom, smartness doesn't last. Mighty. Again, when I was young, I used to grab truck tires, throw them around like they were nothing. Strong as an ox. Can't do that anymore. Strength fades. Not many noble, fortunately I wasn't born into nobility, but not many people that are born into nobility actually can see the simple truth of the gospel. Or, again, the mighty rulers, political leaders, and unsuch. Be thankful you were not born in any of those situations if you are a Christian and can see it. First, that is a timeline I read in a commentary. <laughs> and I guess I'm sure that was an approximation. Why did God allow that to serpent? Symbol to hang around for a thousand years? I've got no idea. I can't explain that. But Hezekiah, trying to bring the, you know, bring things back, destroyed the high places, the temples, and the that brazen serpent. Not until you get to Second Kings that I remember. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. Notice, God chose the foolish things, things that appear foolish to the world. God chose the apostles, men of learn, no learning, no wealth, no social or political standing to proclaim his message. You ever find that interesting, strange? Eleven of his disciples were just lowly Galileans. They were fishermen, tax collectors, peasants. But you know, there was one who was actually a gentleman. He was a Judean. And his name was Judas. Then you have Saul of Tarsus by contrast. He was educated in two cultures. Remember, he studied at the feet of Gamaliel. And we're going to look at this in a minute. The Hebrew of Hebrews, born of the tribe of Benjamin. Very learned man. And he had to give up his religion, his status, maybe even nobility in order to get right in a right relationship with God. 
Paul, in his own words, tells us in Philippians 3, 4 through 6, he says, Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Here you have Paul, a Pharisee, a Hebrew of Hebrews, had to give it all up to get right with God. Again, nobility, it seems to be, I may be reading too much into that. Verse 27, but God has chosen, again, chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, are. I'm sorry, to bring to nothing things that are. But notice the contrast, the opposites that are emphasized, foolish things of the world to shame the wise. Weak things to shame the strong and powerful. Base things to shame the well-born. God chose these things which are despised by men to bring to nothing. Means to abolish, destroy, or make inactive the things that are. And those are the things that are cherished by the high standing, social standing of the people who exalted themselves. They're going to bring all that stuff to nothing. Remember, everything is nothing. You know, what we focus on so much in our lives is all going to be burned up one day. You ever think about that? I remember Linda doing a devote, uh, I think it might have been a ladies' day. We had a, a special cup and saucer in our cabinet, and one of your sons, bouncing the ball one day, broke it. And Linda left that broke. <laughs> huh? Oh, Debbie probably didn't know that. This is a long time ago. They were little when we were helping to raise them. Remember? I told you the other day we helped raise them. Anyway, <laughs> and we, Linda kept that broke cup and saucer sitting on the table for quite a while because it was a reminder. Eventually, everything's going to break. Everything's going to end up in the dump eventually. Think about that. What we put so much stress and effort and work into, eventually all those things that are cherished are going to end up in the landfill, end up in the dump. <clears throat> God uses broken things. Yes, as a reminder of his goodness. That no flesh should glory in his presence. Exactly. God is good. He can use broken things. He used little David. He used all these things we think of as foolishness or broken. Paul, for instance, we will discuss him a little bit deeper um, for his glory. But of him you are. Wait, but of him you are in Christ, who became for us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Let's look at that a little bit deeper. Jesus Christ became for us wisdom from God. Through his work and through his revelation by the Holy Spirit, man is taught wisdom from above, which makes Christians wise unto salvation and righteousness. Through his sacrificial death, man has the opportunity for forgiveness of sins. To, by obeying God's plan of salvation, man is made righteous by the blood of Christ, given a right standing before God. Again, justified. Justified means just as if I had never sinned. And sanctification. Through his work on man's behalf, man has been given the opportunity to be made holy. We are justified and sanctified by his work. Christ did the work on our behalf. Only when we believe and obey his commands, as in James 2, 21 through 23, where it says that Abraham was made righteous because he obeyed God's commands by offering Isaac his son. And redemption. Redemption comes from the great Greek word, apollotrosis. Again, butchering these Greek words which is used to describe the act of paying a ransom to gain the freedom or release of a captive. We were captive in sin. Jesus paid that price. He redeemed us for on our behalf, not that we did anything to deserve it, um, to redeem us. 
that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Jeremiah 9, 24. Glory in the Lord, since all we have and all we are come from God. We are in no position to brag or boast of what we do. We'll talk about that a little more when we get to 1 Corinthians 4, 7. Jeremiah 23 is a very, I mean, 9, 23, 24 says, Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches. Again, you know, how many people do you know with dementia or Alzheimer's? Smart at one time. How many strong people do you know that lost their strength, maybe in an accident? How many wealthy people do you know that have lost their wealth? Maybe not from no fault of their own, maybe because they made bad choices. But we can't glory in any of that. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. We need to understand and know God. That's what God delights in when we do that. Chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. And brethren, again, he's calling them brethren. They are his brothers in Christ. These people in Corinth, these Christians who are, we, we've looked at all the problems they had, all the sins they had. When I came to you, and this is probably a second missionary journey around AD 52, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. Now this word testimony is interesting. The great Greek word there is marturon, which means testimony with evidence. Paul again could do miracles. He probably in the 18 months he was in Corinth did a lot of miracles. He was able to pass that gift of miracles on to these other people. So a lot of them did miracles also. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's the most important thing. Again, Paul, a Pharisee of Pharisees, I mean a Pharisee, a Hebrew of Hebrews, um, highly educated man gave it all up to know Jesus Christ and only him crucified. Except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Let's look at that a little deeper. You know, if Paul wanted to please men, he would have put tack before truth and not mentioned the crucifixion. Why? As we mentioned, Jesus Christ being crucified was a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Greeks. You know, the Greeks with all the Greek gods, if you study Greek, you know, the Greek gods in school or whatever, all these Greek gods, they couldn't fathom one of their gods sacrificing their son. Again, like I said, you know, I'd have figured out another way. Verse 3. I was with you in weakness. We mentioned some of this, and in fear and in much trembling. I want to dive deeper into this with Paul. You know, I was with you in weakness. Paul had much discouraged him before he arrived in Corinth. Even the Lord himself had to encourage him. Paul endured physical ailments, punishment, affliction. And we talked about that in 2 Corinthians. He goes through, you know, how many times he was beaten, how many times he was whipped, how many times he was in prison. He was stoned which led to possibly his death, um, the way it sounds to me. Um, I'll let you study that on your own. In Galatians 4, 13, it sounds like he's ill in Galatia. Um, 2 Corinthians 9 and 10, he has a weak presence. Galatians 6, 11, he talks about his poor eyesight. He has a lot of issues going on with him. Um, and again, this would cause fear. You know, and trembling. And the trembling word is interesting in the Greek. That word is the weight of the gospel and sharing it is why he's trembling because he wants to get it right. He wants to save people. He wants to make sure they understand Jesus Christ and him crucified and what that meant for their salvation. Because again, you know, they had the Jewish religion and you had paganism. That's really all you had at this time. And so Paul was converting the Jews, and he was, went to the Gentiles, which were pagans, and trying to get them to understand that. They cannot understand salvation, or for, I mean, sorry, couldn't understand forgiveness of sins, because that didn't happen in these other religions. As, as um, Martin mentioned Wednesday, the, you know, it just rolled forward every year, every year with the Jewish religion. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, 
but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. You know, Paul didn't teach with the charm and the oratory that the Greeks preferred. You know, they had all these Greek philosophers. He didn't preach that way or talk that way. And his defects afforded him, again, what we just mentioned, all those defects afforded him the most convincing demonstration of the power of the Spirit. And again, these are miraculous powers that we're talking about. And I want to look at 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. And this is where he talks about his thorn in the flesh. But he says, And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Again, this is part of, the, I think, the foolishness of God. He uses weak people. I told you, if you knew me in high school, you would say, that man will never speak in front of people. He is too shy, too introverted. Because I was. <laughs> Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities. Again, some of the things we just covered, his illnesses, his eyesight, all the things he happened to him that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities. How many of us take pleasure in our infirmities? In reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. How many of us look at life that way? When we are weak, that we are strong through cause of Christ, fills the gap between us. We haven't seen many persecutions in this country yet. I say yet. But I remember Michael Grooms talking about, you know, in other countries, people being, you know, they, would, they threw all these Christians in a ditch, threw gasoline on them and caught them on fire. Last year. Last year in Africa. The Muslims did that. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanied signs. Again, that was the reason for miracles. Paul had this. He confirmed the word with the signs and miracles he did. Verse 5, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul intended to ground his converts in the power of God, not to be dependent on human wisdom. Why? Because faith that depends on clever reasoning can be destroyed with a more acute argument or more clever argument. It's very simple. How many people do you know that weren't grounded in the power of God, in the truth, that left their faith? Faith produced by the power of God cannot be overturned. I want to look at some of this a little bit. This being Resurrection Thursday, I was just, Pat came and visited me at the office the other day, and I was telling her, kind of been thinking about going down this rabbit hole just because today is what the world sees as Resurrection Sunday. I prefer to say that than Easter. That's just me personally. But we, as the members of the church, understand every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. We do this in remembrance of me. Every Sunday we have the Lord's Supper because we remember his death, his burial, his resurrection, the sacrifice he did, not just one time a year. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also the Greek. You know, the gospel of Christ. In gospel in Romans 1, 16 here, as Paul preached and confirmed by the Holy Spirit, Mark 16, 20, we just read, John 20 and Hebrews 2, 4, is the power of God unto salvation. Again, the gospel leads to salvation. What is the gospel of Christ? Paul will tell us in 1 Corinthians 15, if we get there in 1 through 4, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which I preach to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. And this is the Old Testament scriptures he's referring to because that's basically all they had at this time. <clears throat> and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. That is the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. 
He rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Again, Christianity, I don't know if you realize this, rises and falls on the truthfulness of the resurrection of Christ. Confucius is still in the ground. I mean, Buddha is still in the ground. All other religions, nobody has a resurrected Lord and Savior except Christianity. And you might not realize this. If you continue reading 1 Corinthians 15, 16 through 19, Paul continues. He says, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most pitied. Again, Paul is saying, if Christ, there's no resurrection, Christ wasn't resurrected. And if Christ wasn't resurrected, our faith is worthless. What you might not realize is atheists and Christians both agree on this point. Don't know if you realize atheists and Christians agree on something. But they do. They agree on this point that the resurrection is paramount of Jesus is the central issue. That the belief in Jesus as our Lord and Savior rises and falls on his resurrection. Either he rose from the dead or he didn't. Here's a quote by one of the fam most famous atheists of the last century, Anthony Flew. I've mentioned him before. Anthony Flew said in a debate as he was having with this Christian leader, he said, the physical, literally, literal, I'm sorry, the physical, literal, bodily resurrection is the best, if not the only reason for accepting that Jesus is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We both agree. We both agree that the identification in defining and distinguishing the characteristics of the true Christian, that it is scarcely possible to make it without accepting the resurrection did literally happen. Not spiritually, not just people having some experience, but literally, Jesus was fully God, fully man, that made these outrageous claims. He physically died, actually died, and then he physically and bodily rose from the dead, walked the earth for 40 days in a resurrected body. And that's what Flew said when he was an atheist. It either happened or it didn't. Everything revolves around that resurrection. Again, the same thing that Paul said. It all revolves around the resurrection. Christ has not been raised. Your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. And those who have fallen asleep, those who have already died, they perished because there is no hope unless Christ was resurrected. Now, here's Anthony Flew again. In 2010, before he passed away, he wrote this book, There is a God. He changed his mind on being an atheist and became, he said, there's a God because of DNA. And I don't know how any scientist could study DNA and, uh, like him and say, there, there's got to be a God to program DNA in every cell. I mean, it's a, it is like a computer program code and there has to be a God. So... That was interesting that he did change his mind on that. But why believe in the resurrection? You know, did Jesus actually exist? I read a study in 2015. The Church of England put a study out that said 22% of their people they did this study with did not believe there really was a Jesus that existed. 22% didn't believe he actually existed. But, you know, the biblical manuscripts are overwhelming I mentioned this in what my other class, and I should have pulled this up so it'd be top of mind for me, that Homer's Iliad, you know, the works of Plato, the works of Socrates, all these people, we have just a very few manuscripts of. Very few. Not many things at all, but we got 25,000 New Testament documents that authenticate the reality of Jesus Christ. We, the external evidence, Josephus, who was a Jewish historian, wrote this, and he was not a Christian, wrote this huge book on the history of the Jewish, Jewish history 
but mentions Jesus Christ as a real person, mentions his brother James being killed. You have plenty the younger Antichius who were Roman historians that mention Jesus Again, external evidence outside of the scripture. Then you have archaeology that's constantly, be, things are being found, constantly, that Jesus did really exist. He was a real person. What was he really like? You know, friend and foe agree he was a great man, a moral philosopher. I even read in a commentary, the Koran talks about Jesus being a prophet, acknowledges him. Not that I believe the Koran is inspired, don't get me wrong, <laughs> but I thought that was interesting. But he claimed a sinless life in John 8, 46. Again, affirmed by history that his life has had more impact. There's more books on ethics, history, and culture written by him than anybody that ever lived. Look at your calendar. Why do we have a calendar the date we got it? Because they tried to make it around his birth. You know, used to have B.C., and I can't remember what that was Latin for. I always said before Christ, A.D., after death. I know that's not what it meant, but now they've changed all that. It's, I don't know, B.C.E. or something, or I can't remember. They're trying to change it because they don't want Christ involved in it, which is interesting, trying to do away with it. Three, the works of Jesus went unchallenged. You know, his miracles, the feeding the 5,000, none of his miracles are disputed. Eyewitness accounts validate his miracles. The Jew, Jewish rabbis who didn't like him or his followers never claimed he didn't perform miracles. They only questioned the source of his power. Matthew 12, 24, it said his power is from, from Beelzebub or Satan. But they didn't challenge his miracles weren't real. Who did Jesus claim to be? His own claim, he says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except by me, John 14, 6. He claimed, God claimed him as his son, Mark 9, 7, when he was being baptized. You've got the Father saying, this is my beloved son. You have the Holy Spirit descending on Jesus as, as you know, descending on Jesus. And you have Jesus in the water. So you've got all three um, of the Godhead there. His followers claimed you are the Christ in Mark um, 8, 27 through 30. His enemies, um, they said, you make yourself to be God. And they're trying to stone him in John 10 because of blasphemy, because he said he is God. You have the eternal sources, plenty, which I'm going to read this letter that we've got of him, archaeological evidence of plenty of the younger in a minute. But the fulfillment of over, you know, the 700 prophecies of the New Testament that Christ fulfilled in his lifetime. But this letter is very interesting. Plenty the Younger wrote a letter to the emperor around A.D. 111. He says, I don't understand this sect. We give them an opportunity to recant, and yet they refuse to worship idols. They refuse to worship Caesar. Again, Caesar claimed to be God. He claimed, you, you had, and he, he wanted to be worshipped. And if you didn't worship Caesar, they, this interesting book, Bob just gave me, I just finished reading so I could give it back to him. Talks about um, some other documents they found. Um, but, you know, they fed them to the beast in the arena for sport if they refused to uh, worship Caesar. They met early in the morning and claimed that a dead man came back to life. They claimed that this dead man is God. They love one another radically. Notice that we as Christians, as the first century Christians, need to love each other radically. And they do strange things, greeting one another with a holy kiss. He goes on and says, why won't they recant? They would rather die because they claim that this Savior is in fact God. What we know is from historical documents that this claim that Jesus was God happened in the first century. Again, this is a letter that this Pliny the Younger did research on for the emperor, trying to understand why would these people won't recant and say, you know, and they would actually let them worship Jesus and worship the emperor, but they wouldn't do that. They'd rather die. I want you to think about that. Did Jesus really die? Again, you know, people say, he just took herbs, slowed his heart down, or didn't really die, or they say, you know, the disciples went to the wrong tomb, or they stole his body. 
But you got to remember, Roman executioners thought he died. That's why they didn't break his legs. Think about the flogging he went through, the beating, the crucifixion, the spear through his side, the medical evidence. Water and heart, I mean, water and blood indicate the puncture of the pericardium, which is the sac around your heart. If the spear went through his side, punctured that, out would come water and blood. The burial preparation, 70 pounds of spices and linen were used in his burial. Yes, he really died. His burial was public and secure. Joseph of Arimathea's tomb, a high-profile member of the Sanhedrin, gave him his tomb. Again, these Roman guards were placed at the tomb. They were experts at killing people. The Romans put a seal on the tomb. It was a very public place. It was made very secure. They said that, I was reading this commentary, said the size of the tombstone, that it was kind of on an incline. So it would only take four or five people to put it into place, but it would take 20 people to move it out of the way. That's how large it was. And remember, these guards were under the penalty of death. If they were caught sleeping on the job, if anything happened, they died. Could Jesus' resurrection possibly be true? Absolutely. Predicted by the Old Testament prophets for hundreds of years. Jesus predicted it openly and repeatedly. Again, as he, we mentioned in Nicodemus in John 3, he appeared to over 500 people in 12 different locations over 40 days after he was resurrected. Notice the transformation that his disciples took. After Jesus' resurrection, remember, Peter said, I'm going fishing. Like, you know, our Lord's dead. I'm going fishing. And then the re you know, after he was resurrected, the transformation they all took, the conversion of Saul the Tarsus we mentioned, you know, the transformation of the Roman Empire and the world that happened under these, under these men. Um, you know, the best legal minds tried to disprove it, but the evidence is overwhelming. I want to look at some of this a minute. Do you realize that Simon Greenleaf, who was a lawyer, he was one of the founders of the Harvard Law School. He was an atheist. One of his students, who was a believer, questioned him and said, you should dig through all the evidence and weigh it just like you would as a trial and see what happens. Simon Greenleaf ended up becoming a Christian after trying to prove it was all fake as a lawyer. Then you've got an, a journalist called Frank Morrison, who again was an atheist. And he decided, I'm gonna destroy this whole Christian myth. And he became an author of Who Moved the Stone, which is a great book on the apologetic study of the resurrection. Again, these atheists that dig deep into it discover, hey, this is true. Historical evidence is overwhelming. I don't know if you've heard of Lee Strobel. He was a journalist, an atheist. His wife was an atheist. His wife decided she's going to become a follower of Christ. And he did not like it. He said, I'm going to disprove this Christianity stuff to show his wife this is just a fairy tale. And he became the author of a book called A Case for Christ. It's actually been made into a movie. I've, I haven't read the book. I have, have seen the movie. It's very interesting. He travels all over the world talking to people, trying to disprove Christianity. It ends up becoming a um, follower of Christ. Not that the, you know, and again, Simon Greenleaf was a lawyer in the 1800s. Frank Morrison was in the 1930s, um, and when his and struggle was in like 79 and 80 when he did all of his research. Again, so these people are spread out over time. Um, but the evidence is overwhelming to become a follower of Jesus if. You just are open-minded enough to truly follow the evidence and not try to work your preconceived ideas into something. Verse 6. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. Now, I want you to notice something. You write in your Bibles, you might note this. The we... In verse 6, 7, 12, and 13, and the us we're going to look at when we get to verse 12, all refers to the apostles. The context of these verses are, are very clear on this when you, when you study this. We need to not study this as this is talking about us today is my point in saying that. 
And I'm sure World Video Bible School, that was their point in saying that too. The apostles preached the true wisdom of God. Again, not worldly men, wisdom, not the wisdom of men. <clears throat> but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. Again, God ordained before the ages. You know, the gospel's not an afterthought. It was planned before time began. It's hard for us to conceive the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit before time began planned that the Son would leave heaven, come to earth, be born of a woman, under the law, live a perfect life, and die for the sins of his creation. But that is plainly what the Bible teaches. And that's the wisdom of God, and that's the mystery that it's talking about because people did not understand could not understand, couldn't get a, their head around this concept. And again, it's for our glory. Romans 8, 16 through 18 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Again, we are never promised we're not going to suffer as Christians. Suffering is a part of life. Sometimes we can't understand it, but what we've got to remember is give God the glory in it, be thankful for our trials, and it's amazing how when you are thankful and grateful, the Lord will take whatever you perceive as this bad thing and turn it in to something good. It's amazing. I can't tell you how many times that's happened in my life. I know that was the second bell. Thank you very much for your kind attendance, and we appreciate everything. And we will pick up with verse 8 next week.